Good morning, everyone. Now, our instruction course is about the demystifying cases of neuroophthalmologic disorders. Changing, it's not changing. Okay. We know the visual pathway plays a very important role in diagnosing the neuroophthalmic disorder and neurological disorder. Hence, the knowledge of the neuroanatomy and neuroimaging uh, will help us in understanding the pathogenesis of signs and symptoms in these disorders. Common mistake sometimes made by an ophthalmologist is not to identify the coexisting intracranial pathology in the case of cataract. Because they try to uh, correlate the visual loss with the, cat with the presence of lenticular opacity. And one thing which we should keep all in mind, then in the mature cater and how dense the cater opacity would be, the pupillary reaction should always be normal because the cater is supposed to scatter the light inside the eye and you know the pupillary reaction is proportional to the acting, the proportional to the acting retina means it stimulates the whole of the retina, hence though the light going inside is less, but as it is scattered, and stimulate the whole of the retina, the pupillary reaction should always be normal. And once in the case of, a, in our OPD, we get a case where we cannot explain the visual loss because uh, with the, uh, we cannot explain by our ocular examination that we label it as an unexplained visual loss, then always get the imaging done to find out any cause behind the eye. Sometimes the compressive lesion present along the path of third cranial nerve, they can cause the synkinetic movement of the third cranial nerve. When we get a case with binocular visual loss with normal pupillary reaction, then we should always think the cause would be either in the optic radiation or the cortical uh, visual cortex. Sometimes we get the patient whose visual behavior is quite normal. You can see like he's moving around perfectly normally without hitting any object, but he can't read your snell and chart. So you can't take the visual acuity. And he cannot, when you show some object visually, he cannot name the object. And even the patient fails to identify his familiar faces. Then before thinking that these are the functional cases, we should think that the lesion might be in the visual associated area, not in the primary visual cortex, because the visual acuity, the form, the color, and you're the shape, you can perceive only, we perceive that primary visual things, perception happens in the visual cortex. The further meaning to that object, what we are seeing, is that take place in the visual association, association areas, in collaboration from philosophy, the sensation from whether sensory cortex. So we should, we should get the imaging done in these cases to find out whether there is a cause with the bilateral, usually it happens in the bilateral lesion of the visual associated cortex before labeling them as a functional visual loss, as a case of functional. So our uh, instruction course would be, based, would be a case-based approach to the various disorders affecting the visual afferent efferent pathway and various neurovascular neuroophthalmological disorder. So I start with the cases. Can I have my second presentation, please? Second is in this. This is about a 30-year-old female. She came to our OPD with a history of horror holocranial headache for last three months, which was associated with transient visual obscuration lasting for a few seconds. And she also gave a history of recent gain in weight. This headache used to increase on the straining, like coughing, sneezing, and these attacks of transient visual obscuration used to happen whenever she would change her posture. This symptomatology will tell us that she must be having some intracranial pathology. Headache with visual problem, always we keep on, we, it leads us to think that it must be intracranial pathology. When we examine the patient, the equity and mortality was normal, people was norm, were normal. The fundi show 
a marked papilledema. Definitely the field will show enlargement of the blind spot. OCT will th show the thickening of retinal nerve fiber layer, while the rest of the systemic examination, including the neurological examination, was normal. So this is the patient presenting with increased intracranial pressure, with the features of increased intracranial pressure, with no neurological localizing sign and symptom, then one diagnosis which should come in our mind is this benign intracranial hypertension, which is also called as idiopathic intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri. Now, just to fulfill the tight modified dandy criteria, then we should get an imaging done to rule out any space occupying lesion. So we got the so we got the imaging done. Another uh, entity which can assemble with this type of presentation would be any tumor present inside the ventricle of the cranial cavity. So we got the imaging done. You can get even contrast CT or contrast MRI. It's better to get contrast MRI, which gives a more better detail of the brain. And we asked for MRA and MRV. And this image, when we got the imaging done, we found the features of idiopathic intracranial pressure in the form of empty cellar syndrome and dilatation of meningeal spaces around the optic nerve as shown by arrows. Now to make further, like once you get the imaging, normal imaging, the next step should be to find out the CSF pressure. And we have to get the CSF examined routinely, microscopically, even the culture should be done because some of the cases of mild meningitis, tubercular, or fungal, they may mimic as idiopathic intracranial pressure. In, uh, they can present clinically as idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So we went got, when we got the LP done, the opening pressure was high, more than three millimeter of mercury, and the CSF examination were normal. So we, on the basis of our clinical examination investigation, we made a diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial pressure, hypertension, and she also gave a history of, she was a female, and she gave a history of recent gain in weight. So we got, we asked her to do the weight loss done and restricted the sodium intake, gave her the Diamox. But she came after six weeks with further worsening of the symptoms and the fundus picture. We thought there must be another pathology. What we realized, what we asked them to do MRV and MRA, they were the conventional MRV which was done. I thought with such, much, such a severe papilledema, you don't get in the case, usually don't get in the case of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. With such a severe papilledema, you get in the cases where there is a venous sinus block. Thinking that in my mind, I asked them to get the contrast MRV done. And now you can see the contrast MRV showed a tight narrowing at the junction of the dominant transverse sensigmoid sinus junction with hypoplasia of the left transverse sinus. We know the left transverse sinus takes very little part in the venous drainage of the brain. It's a right venous sinus, which is a very important sinus, which takes, which drains most of the blood from uh, venous blood from the brain. And you know, the most of the CSF is absorbed by arachnoid granulation present in the venous sinuses. So any blockage in the venous sinus will result in a in marked increase in intracranial pressure with such a severe papilledema. Once you make this, this diagnosis, then what should be the next step? The next step to see whether this is a cause of IIH or it's a effect of IIH. So just to see the effect of IIH, this type of narrowing should disappear when you do, when you repeat MRV after the lumbar puncture. But this one with the persistent type of rigid tight stenosis. And the second step would be to find out whether this narrowing is significant or not. Sometime in IH cases you get the narrowing, but that is not significant. And for that you have to do, you have to measure the pressure proximal and distal to the stenosis with the help of this microcatheter and the Pressure, that the difference in the pressure is more than four, then you should you think it's a significant narrowing and needs to be attended, which needs to be taken care of. In our patient, the pressure uh, gradient was more than 10 millimeter of mercury. Hence, we asked the neurologist to do the angioplasty of the sinus, and the, they put the stent 
and if there was a delay for the cystic stenosis with the proper drainage of the sinus venous return was assume, was resumed and the patient became also asymptomatic uh, in the follow up the second patient is about a 18 year old male patient who presented with complaints of bilateral decrease in vision for one month he gave a family history of decrease in vision on the maternal side his maternal uncle also had a loss of vision at the similar at the at the same age when we examined the patient he had a severe visual decrease in the visual acuity the color vision was impaired the pupils were sluggish react, reacting to the light fundus showed if you can appreciate on the hyperemia of the disc and there were the dilated telangiectasia blood vessels over the disc and in the pavi papillary area and there was a mild blurring of the disc with temporal pallor this type of fundus picture in a young male who had a family history maternal side family history of visual loss so we know this is a hereditary type of optic neuropathy and which hereditary type of optic neuropathy it would be a labor's hereditary optic neuropathy because it's a classical presentation of a labor's hereditary optic neuropathy where you get dilated telangiectasia blood vessels over the disc in a male around the age of 10 to 30 between the age of 10 to 30 years with a uh, maternal family history of decrease in the vision and the field examination in this patient showed dense central scotoma we get the dense central scotoma in these cases because these are the macular retinal ganglion cells which are mainly affected in these cases so the patient will have a central scotoma could not read will not be able to identify the faces because of the central scotoma but he would be able to move around because of the because of the preserved peripheral field of vision when you do ffa and these discs they also show a little bit of edema which we call as a pseudo edema but one very classical feature of the disease is when you do the ffa you don't get the you get the <coughs> you don't get the leakage of the dye in the late stage of fa we should be there when you have a papilledema so any patient which i showed the clinical scenario and when you find the fundus mild edematous disc with dilated telangiectasia blood vessels over the disc with marked decrease in the vision with a family history maternal side decrease in the vision and on a fa you don't get a leak then you also get you get the confirmation this is a case of labor's hereditary optic neuropathy now what should be the nas investigation the nas investigation would be a genetic study because we all know the cause of this this, this uh, optic neuropathy is the mitochondrial point mutation when we got the genetic study done we found we got the point mutation was 11778 and this is the commonest point mutation you get and it has a to find out the point mutation it also helps us in telling about the visual prognosis in these cases when this type of mutation is present the patient will have a severe visual they have a very poor visual prognosis they will end up with the marked loss of vision and in the, even with the blindness the treatment is coq enzyme q and benalgesic you know coq enzyme q is a complex one which takes place in the electron transmitter in the respiratory chain which takes place in the mitochondria it is a mitochondrial cytopathy and the gene which i told you is responsible for encoding the coen complex one of the respiratory chain and coenzyme q is a synthetic derivative of that complex one that means it's a benzo mm, benzoquinone and if you it's supposed to play an important role in preserving the vision and in some cases in increase the vision in these patients so our patient end up with the 660 vision and is that a stable vision on the treatment um. now about the third patient is a 14 year male patient who presented with transient visual obscuration in the right eye so it's a young patient who had uh, hemorrhagic phagax in the right eye when we examined the patient his uh, bp and the pulse were normal on the left side but there was non recordable pulse and bp on the right side but not neuroptomic examination was normal so the two possibility came in our mind because looking at the age of the patient it might be takayasu or embolic phenomena 
when we got the investigation done, we didn't find any cardiac cause of embolization, not any systemic cause of embolization. The CT angio of this patient showed there was a narrowing of the subclavian artery, and this narrowing was because of the presence of the cervical drip. And after the narrowing, there was a dilatation of the subclavian artery because of the presence of the thrombus inside it. But the pathology was happening in the subclavian artery, which doesn't take part in the blood supply of our eye. So what was the cause? It was a rare cause. You, we know the embolism can happen and degrade. But this, this MRS effigox was because of the retrograde R2ART embolization from this thrombus, which are present into the subclavian artery post-sternotically. And you know the sub, our common carotid artery and subclavian artery on the right side take origin from the same trunk, that brachiocephalic trunk. So the detrogate uh, embolization happens from subclavian to the common carotid to internal carotid and ophthalmic artery, which resulted into MRS effigox. So beside the uh, Takayasu, in the case of young, the cause of MRS effigox could be, which is a very rare cause, cervical day we should keep in our mind. So I will request the next presenter to present his thesis.